Today is August 24, 2020. My guest is economist Lisa Cook of Michigan State University. She has written widely on the role of race in American economic history. I want to thank Plantronics for providing today's guest with the Blackwire 5220 headset. And I want to let listeners know that today's conversation may include topics that are disturbing to young children. Lisa, welcome to Econ Talk. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you for having me. Our topic for today is the research you've done on innovation and racism, along with some of your other work on the role of racism in affecting entrepreneurship. I also hope we get to the present moment as well. I want to start with your work on violence and economic growth. You were interested in how violence, particularly lynching and race riots, affected patenting and innovation. So describe that research. So I'd like to start with the motivation for the research. I was working on the Russian economy, the the post-Soviet economy. I was writing my dissertation on Russian banking in Moscow. I was doing surveys of banks and entrepreneurs. And one thing that I kept getting a question about from both bankers and entrepreneurs was, why doesn't innovation come to Russia? They had it during the Tsarist period. They had it during the Soviet period. But why is it not uh, coming back now that they had intellectual property uh, laws on the books, intellectual property rights protected ostensibly? Uh, why wasn't it coming? And, you know, I didn't have an answer for them. Uh, I wasn't working on innovation at the time. I was working working on uh, property rights, but not uh, not the kind they were thinking about. So I uh, put that question on the back burner. I needed to finish my dissertation. I needed to get a job. You know, I needed to do some other things, but, but it nagged me. And I was just wondering if there could be an historical experiment that could elucidate what my response would be, because I saw one banker per month being killed in Russia on average. And that was a sector I was studying. And I was thinking, well, that could be <laughs> and uh, a barrier to innovation or a barrier to people doing productive things in general. So I started thinking about an historical experiment that might elucidate this. And uh, I was drawn to uh, inventors and, and, and invention in the U.S. and I was drawn to the period when there was violence that was visited upon uh, African-Americans, and this was riots, lynchings, and segregation laws that enabled and uh, protected that kind of extra-legal behavior. And, uh, and I thought that this was a kind of experiment that might uh, that might elucidate the Russian situation, and I, I, I what I found was um, was uh, better than I expected with respect to an illustration. What we see is that when this violence kicks up in the U.S., uh, African Americans stop inventing. African American inventors stop inventing, and when it subsides, they start uh, inventing again. But It remains the case that 1899 is still the peak year for invention uh, per capita for African Americans. So this can have a long-term persistent effect, but uh, I'll I'll stop there because I I will tell possibly the rest of the story, but that's how the research got started. And I wanted to use this as a cautionary tale for, uh, for Russia. I mean, I got my answer. It wasn't necessarily what I... Uh, scripted. Uh, I had no priors, really. I just wanted to see if this would be uh, elucidating, and it was. And when I gave this talk, the people who keep me engaged uh, about this, who are always engaged in a seminar, keep me afterwards for questions, are from China. They're from Russia. They're from Ukraine. They're from the former Soviet Union. And they understand how personal security, the lack of protection of the rule of law, can inhibit intellectual property rights protection and can inhibit innovation from happening in general. And of course, we know that's the uh, bedrock, the foundation of long-term growth. So that's uh, that's where the research got started and it's uh, it's punchline. And I'm reminded a little bit of, uh, of our conversation here on um, about the book In the First Circle by Solzhenitsyn, which is about <laughs> the attempt by the Soviet regime to have its scientists and mathematicians innovate in the gulag. Mm-hmm, and of mm-hmm. course, the tension and the poignance and the power that 
book, part of it comes from the fact that science doesn't advance very well in an atmosphere of fear and and politics. And we watch these these prisoners desperately struggle with the ethics of what they're doing, the morality of what they're doing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just just the the climate of stress and and intensity. And I. Right. I'm sympathetic to your finding because of that. I think the you and I as academics know that science, scholarship, research requires a certain level of serenity mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. to, to have mm -hmm. uh, the kind of thoughts that, mm -hmm. that lead to breakthroughs and, and innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I think what you've tried to do is so ambitious <laughs> uh, that, that, that I have some skepticism about it. So I want you to talk about the incredible amount of work you had to do just to get your data ready for any kind of analysis. So thank you for that uh, suggestion. I actually didn't know about uh, Schultz and Nietzsche's work, but as you probably know, I have a whole research agenda on investigating innovation during the Soviet period and all of these experiments that were tried and failed. And the thing that worked was allowing uh, Soviet inventors to obtain patents outside of the Soviet Union, namely in the U.S. So we were the only ones who were able to validate uh, whether this was the original idea. This is something that motivated uh, Russian scientists, and these were largely scientists. These weren't uh, like American in inventors. Most of these were scientific teams at yeah. institutes. So anyway, thank you for that uh, for that yeah, we'll reference. Talk. Yeah, uh, but getting back to my work, it was <laughs> an incredible feat. I had no idea what I was embarking on. Uh, this was a second or third dissertation. Uh, I had thought that these had already been identified. I did not know that uh, race did not appear on patents. So that was the first thing. I needed to identify uh, African-Americans who were in the patent data. Uh, now, I thought that was going to be a doable, feasible thing uh, because there was a whole research agenda in economics related to black names. Now, one thing that I did notice uh, was that these were post-civil uh, rights era names that were being used in this literature in the 2000s, Mullenathan and Bertrand, Bertrand Mullenathan, uh, Fryer and Levitt, uh, and I thought that would be fairly easy to identify them in the data. Well, it wasn't. And there had never been a systematic review of black names in the historical period before the civil rights era. So I wound up creating the first uh, list, the first uh, systematic investigation, identification of black names and uh, in, in the historical period. And I needed those to be able, I thought, to identify uh, African-Americans in the data set. Well, it worked okay. <laughs> it didn't work out so well. Many of these did not have uh, typical African-American names for the period I was covering from 1870 to 1940. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so it was, um, so it was, it was, uh, it was interesting in that sense. So it wasn't, it, that wasn't the right approach. So I needed, or it wasn't a complete approach. So I needed to do something else. So I needed to try to find the universe of people who would be inventors. And I looked in every directory imaginable uh, of scientists, of, uh, of educated people, of just famous uh, people. And, and so this is what was done for inventors generally, for the literature at the time. So I was following uh, their methodology. And that didn't prove uh, to be so useful. African-Americans often weren't in these uh, who's who editions, uh, famous uh, people, well-known people. Uh, so I just tried to find articles about inventors and uh, looked in every uh, nook and cranny. I started reading obituaries because often uh, African-Americans weren't identified as inventors during their lifetimes or they didn't identify themselves as inventors in the census, but their relatives would in, uh, identify them as inventors rather than as machinists as they might have identified uh, themselves as in the census. So it was a, a sweeping effort. And for each of those data sets, 
it took about a year. So uh, I was at Stanford from uh, 2002, 2005, and that's where most of this uh, initial research got done. And uh, it was a it was a sweeping effort. So you're right. It it was ambitious, but it wasn't ambitious by intent. Not from the outset. I thought it was going to be a much easier, uh, a much easier slog. Talk about the the magnitudes that are involved here. I think it's really important to help people because what you're going to look at is the impact of lynching, race riots segregation laws as well on patenting by African-Americans. And I think it's one of the most important pieces of the work is just to lay out just those magnitudes to get a feel for, I think a lot of people would have said, well, I mean, before civil rights, before the, say the 1960s, how many black inventors were there? I mean, they're obviously very poor, um, limited economic opportunity due to educational failings, racism, and so on. So give us a feel for how much patent activity there was in this time period, and then give us a feel for how much uh, lynching and other uh, atrocities are are present in in this time period. Uh, Go ahead. The magnitudes are are small, but they, I mean, what I find is that uh, the number of uh, patents that would be missing would have constituted the patents that we would have seen in that same period from a medium-sized European country, which would have been substantial. So I, I think we really want to make sure that we have the, uh, the perspective of the entire uh, data set. Now, per capita, you uh, see from the first uh, graph, uh, what you see is the uh, different orders of magnitude with respect to patenting per capita for uh, African-Americans versus all other uh, patentees. And uh, white, they're assumed to be white, all others are assumed to be white if they're not uh, black in this data set. And uh, the uh, orders of magnitude are, are quite different. And that is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna say that from the outset, I'm looking at the direction of invention and innovation for this uh, for this paper, uh, and they were moving in the same direction before 1899, and they started moving in opposite directions after uh, these waves of violence. So I'm taking into account though all those factors that you mentioned. So I'm taking into account literacy in the uh, in the estimation in the formal estimation. I'm taking into account uh, literacy. Um, Uh, and job opportunities, the occupations they were in, um, taking into account the overall economy. So I I think I'm controlling for the factors that you you mentioned. And that's not my criticism. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to set the stage. You know, Mm -hmm. I think the context is is for me, the the numbers are actually surprisingly large. I'm suggesting not not the impact. There's two factors here. There's the level and Mm -hmm. then the change in response to the violence. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. The the level in the absence of violence, or at least when the violence not absence, but in, when the violence was lower, the level is actually to me surprisingly high given the handicaps that the African American community faced. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, and and you identify a number of of important inventions and uh, creativity of of the community in the face of those challenges that, that I think is quite actually quite inspiring. But your point is that starting around 1900, uh, it it takes a big uh, drop. The, the drop is Correct. a little, it, it, while the white level of white innovation and, and patents by white white inventors co- continues to, to, to stay high mm. or rise. And I, that's the, the point of the paper, correct? Right, exactly, exactly. That, and, and this was the, the alarm bell that went off for me. Inventors have many of the same characteristics. And this is the point of other papers that I've written about. Uh, Great inventors have some of the same characteristics, whether they're white or black. They are mobile. They're highly mobile. They go to where the opportunities are. So I wanted to know what the, how the incentives changed for the two sets of inventors. 
why would some respond to incentives and others others not? Uh, so during wartime, there is an incentive to invent. Uh, certainly the composition of invention changes, but still there's an incentive to invent. And I didn't see that. I didn't see African-Americans responding to that. So it, it, something just seemed weird. And I wanted to figure out what was happening. So you're, you're absolutely right in that sense. It had an economic, uh, economic motive. The uh, alarm bells rang out with respect to innovation, the incentives for innovation. I guess that the, one of the challenges I have, listeners know I'm very skeptical of, of econometric work generally, so don't take it too personally, Lisa. Sure. Um, but one of the challenges here is is teasing out the independent impact of, mm-hmm. uh, of say, lynching or race riots. Um, what, what, what in, in a Jewish context in Russia would, would be called a pogrom, a, mm-hmm. an act of of basically state sanctioned violence where the police step aside and let really evil people perpetrate violence mm-hmm. on um, innocent people. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that's not good for invention. No, no, right, there's, right, you right, can't, right, there's right. nothing to debate there. The question right. is, is the, is the, what's the causal piece that causes dramatic changes? Is it that they can't travel to where the opportunities are? Or is there something else going on below the surface, mm-hmm. you know, like a failure of the that's education system that's right. really the causal, the causal driver of, of, of the change? So, of, of course, there would be uh, – you know, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, and that's why I decided to make sure that I had as many – Differing data sets as I could get uh, that would be independent of this data set, uh, but could uh, be illustrative. And as you saw at the end of the paper, I use uh, newspapers, uh, and we see exactly the same pattern: this dramatic drop in 1899. And I would say that it was all of these factors together that there was something uh, in the water that was changing. Uh, Maybe it's that uh, racial animus that uh, the Southerners were imposing on the rest of the country. So, you know, the Civil Rights Act of uh, of 1875 was being rolled back and challenged by the Southern states. And they started winning. And certainly the big prize was uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. So they put it into reconstruction in that way. So I would that's say 1896. 18. Uh, that's right. It's 1896, but it takes about three years, as my uh, constitutional law colleagues tell me. It takes uh, a couple of years, at least a couple of years, for rulemaking to uh, to start, and I think that that's where you see a rupture. Uh, and uh, inventors being able to see one another freely, say at public libraries. So you have the segregation of uh, of public accommodations, of public spaces. Uh, inventors are not able to get to their patent attorneys. There aren't uh, African American patent attorneys until the 1970s. So they were heavily dependent on uh, white patent attorneys, and they weren't able to get to them because uh, central commercial districts, business districts, would have been all white. So so I think that this had the same effect in, in baseball. You had organized baseball that was integrated until the late 1890s, and then it was segregated. And we have the same kind of uh, the same kind of phenomena happening. That uh, you you see a decline in productivity, but you see alternate universes that arise, and then they come back together in the 1940s, 1950s. And it's a little bit different than the standard story you started with, where, say, a lack of property rights uh, discourages innovation because you can't capitalize on the costs that you've incurred with future gains. Uh, I'm struck by a finding you talk about, not a finding, but a, a, an empirical uh, finding that, that you mentioned in another piece of your work, which is that in this part of this period, we're looking 
just to remind listeners, we're looking at basically 1870 to 1940, and we see sort of a break point around 1900. And yet in 1900 to 1930, there's quite a bit of black entrepreneurship. Uh, and it, it strikes me that that your story, if if your empirical finding, your kind of metrics are, are capturing what's going on, that maybe it's an example of of segregation per se, what you're just what you were talking about, the inability to to mingle with other folks, whether it's whether it's white attorneys, whether it's intellectual influences from libraries or other social or intellectual gatherings that aren't as easy as it mm-hmm. used to be. It's mm-hmm. not so much fear. I mean, the fear part is horrible, but it's I don't know how important that is in the patenting, inventive, innovation destruction right. rather than the segregation per se. Right. OK, so I'll, I'll give you an example. So, um, you know, where I started my story was with the lack of uh, rule of law. But let me give you a few examples. My cousin, Percy Julian, who was the first uh, director of a corporate research lab of Glenn Laboratories, first African-American admitted to the National Academy of Sciences. His house was firebombed twice. This is it, it is violence. I, I want to be very clear about that. What oh, was WB mean- what was WB Du Bois doing at this time? So let's let's uh, take an example from uh, the early period uh, here, uh, let's say in the uh, the 1900, um, 1906 Atlanta riot. What was WB Du Bois doing? He was in Tuskegee in Alabama collecting uh, data, you know, famous sociologist, one of our uh, first contributors to economic information, economic data on African Americans. And he had to come back from rural Alabama, come back to Atlanta, pack up his family, get a gun, move his family. All of his research stopped. All of it just stopped all of a sudden. So it, I, I think that segregation had something to do with it. I absolutely, that's why I keep segregation laws in. But it's also violent because they have a differential effect. Different, uh, these three different factors have different effects on innovation. So uh, segregation laws, for example, have a greater impact on electrical patents. And I can see how that might be the case, right? Because you might have many more steps involved, uh, many more steps involving other people related to electricity. So segregation laws, the introduction of segregation laws could stop uh, that kind of innovation, that kind of invention in several different places. So th- to me, that makes a, a lot of sense. Lynchings would have a greater impact on, let's say, mechanical ones where you might need to go to work, uh, to work on a railroad, or that's where you typically work. And lynchings make uh, people flee and uh, intimidate people. So I can see how different uh, types of violence have uh, different impacts on uh, various types of innovation. No, I don't mean to suggest that they didn't. I, I was just trying to contrast the growth and, and certainly agree with you on, on all that, obviously. The, I'm just thinking about the growth of entrepreneurship which over this time period of 1900 to 1930, which I presume was mainly within the African-American community no, the, and not no, you're broader. Right. You're right. You're, you're right. And this is, I mean, this is a, a, a clear uh, contrast. African-Americans had to serve the African-American community. So this was a golden age. Uh, some people characterize this, scholars characterize this as the golden age of African-American businesses. Well, they had no other options. And they turned out to be, you know, there. but there were businesses, uh, black businesses before uh, 1899 or 1896. And what we saw, and we see this through uh, different inventors, is that they stopped selling to the public because the, uh, the racial discrimination coming from consumers was increasing. So they decided to stop interacting with consumers and they became wholesalers or they, uh, they found some way not to interface with the uh, public. But that also meant that their clients may wind up being poor because average uh, African Americans were going to be poor, especially if they were going to be uh, in the North. So we had uh, the weird thing is that we had African Americans setting aside 
like white days at the skating rink or white days at the pool if a pool was being operated by uh, African Americans. And this is the way uh, other businesses segregated themselves. Maybe they had black days. Uh, Certainly museums had black days or uh, fairs. Featuring inventions had black days. So they started using some of the same tactics to be able to uh, attract uh, white customers. So I think that that is a stark contrast. But these inventions typically were not uh, for black people. They weren't servicing just uh, black people. They were outside the black community. Uh, Garrett Morgan's uh, traffic light was for everybody. The gas mask was for everybody. It was for the military. It was for fire departments. So they had to sell to a much broader audience. Well, I think the you raise another factor, which is the if there's a rise in racism on the part of white c- consumers – the economic incentives for black invention are going to be smaller, except for their ability to be anonymous. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I, I wouldn't push that too far personally. I, 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 and it's not I, – I, I don't think it's just an economic it's, – it's not just those financial incentives. It's the other incentives, I think, of fear and being at ease and other things that I think make, make, would make invention harder. Uh, let's turn to Garrett Morgan because it's an extraordinary story. Uh, you want to add something? Go ahead. So, so I, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm not sure I understand. I think that um, the the entrepreneurs had the opportunity to sell exclusively to uh, African Americans. This is not necessarily something they wanted to do. No, they, no, of you course know, not. They, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, no. um, and often. Those uh, businesses couldn't get insurance. Uh, you know, the uh, African American homeowners couldn't uh, get mortgages, even though you know mortgages were were fairly rare uh, before the 1930s. But even still, that would help with financing innovation, and African Americans didn't have access to uh, to to that. So I'm I'm. I'm suggesting that entrepreneurs had a slightly different experience, and and I think that we're going to get to this uh, talking about er- uh, Garrett Morgan, and I think an example like that would be uh, illustrative because he changed his business uh, based on how segregation was growing and how racial animus from the customers was uh, growing. Now, I was actually, I think you misunderstood. What I, I was making a different point before. I was trying to make the argument that entrepreneurship. Local entrepreneurship, starting a, a business in your local community mm-hmm. was different for if you were an inventor trying to sell to a broader audience. If you were an inventor selling to a broader audience and suddenly because of racial reason, racism and other problems, mm-hmm. you weren't going to be able to market that effectively to, the, to white uh, customers, there'd be a financial incentive – in and of itself, that would discourage before, black before innovation. the violence happens, yes. or after the violence happens, uh, after it happens. And so, so right. my point it's was a, that right. was that it, that I don't think that's the whole story. I think there are psychological and other forms of impact, not just the financial disincentives that violence brought to the uh, to the black inventor. That, that right. was my no, only that, point. That's, okay, that's 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 fair enough. But I would argue that people like Garrett Morgan found ways to adapt. Yeah. And that there was both a financial incentive and and you know he was selling hair care products to uh, to the black community while he was trying to sell uh, his gas mask to the largely to the white community, the fire department. Yeah, let's talk so let's talk to, let's talk about that. Talk about uh, the Garrett Morgan story, what he was doing creatively to uh, get around some of the challenges he was facing. One of the things that you mentioned that I'll pick up on is that patents helped some inventors stay anonymous. So all you see recorded is the name and the place where the person lived. So there was no internet at the time. There was no way to fact check who was whom. And this happened a, a lot that uh, people with um, with non-black sounding names at the time 
uh, would show up for different jobs or to sell their inventions, and they were turned away because it was found out that they were not white, as it was suspected, but they were black. So Garrett Morgan, in particular, found uh, creative ways to keep selling to his uh, white customers. Uh, he uh, sold his gas mask in different ways uh, by hiring uh, white salesmen who pretended to be Garrett Morgan. So in uh, searching out uh, newspapers uh, during this period and just looking for Garrett Morgan doing what he did across the country, uh, we found somebody pretending to be Garrett Morgan is, you know, selling the gas mask, demonstrating it. And, uh, and this is clearly a white person because it would have been big news had this been a black person. I don't think a black person would have felt comfortable being you know, this far out in a rural area in, uh, in New York at the time. So that's one thing that he did. He also hired a Native American to pretend to be him and he pretended to be his research assistant. So they would both be at the demonstration, but you know, uh, Native Americans were uh, were known for their famous medicine shows, and they were thought to be uh, rather clever, rather inventive with their boats and the moccasins and their uh, their chemical remedies, their plant remedies. So, so they were trusted as people who could uh, could be inventive. So he hired a Native American to work with him. So uh, that he would be the one answering all the questions, right? So uh, this was just to get his uh, foot in the door. So that's one thing he did. Then he just started dressing up like the uh, this uh, this Native American chief, and he would uh, answer these uh, questions as well. So he was being very creative and trying to. Uh, trying to sell uh, the gas mask. What added Garrett Morgan was this disaster at uh, at Lake Erie, where by no one could bring out the uh, the workers working under Lake Erie. They're they building a gas line under Lake Erie, and uh, there was this disaster. People had died, and he got his brother in the middle of the night. Uh, they put on the gas mask and they started bringing people out. So they started bringing out both the people who were still alive and those who had already passed away, but they're the only ones who could do it. So this was the ultimate trial, ultimate test of their gas mask. So he was successful at doing this. And the unfortunate thing for him was that his picture appeared in the paper with his gas mask and bringing out these uh, dead bodies and these people who were alive. Uh, so he wasn't given the uh, accolades, all the accolades for bring, bringing people out uh, dead or alive, but it was shown that this was an African-American and uh, Southern uh, Fire Department who had ordered the gas mask uh, canceled their orders. So he, he suspected this was ha- would happen and in, in fact it did happen. Yeah, it's incredible. It just... Uh- the oh, just an example of incredible uh, entrepreneurial creativity combined with the inventive uh, right. ability that he had. What year was that? Um, that, that was it. yeah, roughly. Um, this was from the mid nineteen tens to uh, the mid nineteen thirties. I would say. Yeah, I, I guess really, you know, I kind of minimize the financial incentives, but but obviously. If there's rising racism or racial racial animus from white consumers or southern fire departments, that's not a trivial effect on the demand for your product. If you want to make it, create innovation, it's right, it's not right. irrelevant. Right, right. But but to your point, I would say it's not just uh, financial. You know, he went into. I I thought he was a a consummate entrepreneur, and I think he's underappreciated in that sense. He also was selling real estate, and he was selling real estate for black communities to evolve. And he was saying that it was a place of peace and leisure, a place where they could uh, be themselves and interact without the threat of uh, violence or the threat of being discrimination, uh, just being discriminated against. So I think that the incentives, it, and it didn't seem to be a big business, you know, and his papers, this wasn't a major feature, but uh, but certainly it was there, and it was a surprise that it was there. I had no idea that he engaged in that as well. Uh, 
do you worry that in your uh, you have to tell me how much of your research depends on obviously you have to identify the patents you said you use as the race of the patent holder did you worry that some of and you may have mentioned the article i don't remember did you worry that some of the patents may have been uh african-american inventors using white names to because of the very factors we're talking about now after say 1900 so I, I don't think so because the names – remember, I have data from 1870 going forward, right? So I wasn't able to, to find uh, these names in the period uh, before 1899 based on typical techniques for identifying uh, African Americans in large data sets. So I don't think – they uh, change their names. They would have to change their names a lot. And you know, this is this is funny. You should bring that up because uh, the only conversation that I had with Milton Friedman, and it was a seminal conversation, uh, was <laughs> about this. And um, you know, he not only did he encourage me to uh, pursue this, to publish it, publish it in uh, a top five journal, but he also worried that maybe the violence caused people to change their race to to pass. Represent. Yeah. And right, 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 and and uh, you know certainly we have uh, evidence of this happening. There's a, a great book by uh, Jaspin called um, uh, "Alive in the Bitter Waters," where he shows all over the country where there was uh, a violent event and people showed up in neighboring counties or in uh, counties throughout the U.S. as another race that that some people were passing, but for the uh, a number of inventors to fall out like this uh, so dramatically, uh, there would have to be a lot of passing. There would be have to be a lot of people changing their names, and I just don't see that. I don't see that happening. Well, I guess the other issue is you, it's not so useful to have a patent in, in a in somebody else's name. <laughs> I mean, you definitely- no, right, right, right. No, exactly, exactly. Especially because I mean, you bring up an interesting point. When you see advertisements from that period, uh, and I've compared uh, other inventors in Cleveland, uh, white inventors in Cleveland to Garrett Morgan, uh, you know, famous inventor in Cleveland, and everything, everything that was advertised with respect to those inventions had the person's picture on it. So Edison, Edison was everywhere. Right. Sure. Right. And and so so and inventors really. Uh, wanted to identify with their inventions because that's what everybody else did. And when you look at the hair care products that uh, Garrett Morgan also produced, his picture was there and everybody in his family, right? But you don't see this for all the other products that he was selling to uh, the broader community. Uh, before we move on, I want, I want to just mention one issue that I think is um, – I want to let you react to, which is – you look at the impact of, of patenting, which, of course, as you suggested early on, the magnitudes are enough to that because of this violence, there was a reduction in patenting that an in innovation that was non-trivial. Uh, I just I, I always worry about our focus on things that can be measured. Sure. And of course, sure. growth growth is important, That's right. but despair That's right. is. To me, more important, and I wondered as you were doing this very focused work on mm-hmm. patents and growth mm-hmm. rates and, and innovation, mm-hmm. whether you ever worried about the fact that you were going to lose sight of the human cost, which is not measurable, of lynching and and segregation and riots. I, I never lost sight of the human cost, and in fact, uh, I I had to stop working on it when Google search started bringing up images of lynchings. And uh, I started this work much before uh, Google was uh, including these. And it was just, it it was traumatizing. It was traumatizing. Uh, It was less traumatizing to my uh, students, but still we, I I kept checking in with them. So I think that's a fair question. But I, but I particularly am glad you raised the question of measurement because I started with inventions, not just patents. And it was so hard to find these inventions recorded someplace 
and and it and systematically and i you know someone would claim that he or she would have an invention and i couldn't find it recorded anywhere couldn't find it in trademark records for example or even in copyright records but that but but i think you're right now you point to something that is very interesting about this period uh, the most contested patents in us history and uh, may still be is the cotton gin uh, an invention of an African American slave that was uh, being used on a Georgia plantation, and Eli Whitney just happened to be the first person to get to the patent office. Now, it wasn't uh, Jim's, uh, I think he was Jim's father, who was the one who, the enslaved uh, person whose father actually invented it, who was contesting it. It was the other planters in the region of that plantation who were quickly using it and quickly upgrading it. And that's true for most agricultural innovation at the time. And they were very angry about not having been the first to get to the patent office and they were the ones uh, suing him. So so you're, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of agricultural innovation that African-Americans were engaged in and that all people are engaged in, especially Southerners. But because it happened so fast, they typically don't get a patent for it. And uh, this is something that they thought, these planners thought, that Eli Whitney was taking advantage of. The fact mm. that they don't uh, register a lot of uh, Southerners and, and rural people, people engaged in agriculture, typically don't do. So I think that's a, a fair question. But I'm very, I'm, I'm, uh, very aware that this doesn't capture all innovation. It doesn't capture all invention. And uh, it's just too hard to study uh, those other things. And it doesn't capture all the costs. And I think the, yes, absolutely. the human costs, yeah. you know, no, I, that's right. as an economist, or semi-former economist, the part of economics I don't like is the emphasis on what can be measured uh, to the exclusion yeah. of other things. Obviously, a good mm -hmm. economist doesn't exclude them, but mm -hmm. hard, sometimes hard to keep that in mind. Right. I, I, want to, I want to move to the current moment, and I know you've been involved. I want to look at two topics, the state of economics as a profession and the, um, the reckoning that we're at least trying to have some of us on, on race, race issues here in America. Uh, let's start with the economics profession. You're involved with efforts to, to change the uh, level of diversity in the profession. Talk about what, what you think is going on there. So one of the things that I learned from this research, and uh, as you know, it took me uh, a decade and many, uh, many twists and turns to get the research published. And one thing that I just walked away from the research with was that we need to minimize the barriers to the free flow of ideas. And the barriers in my research happened to be uh, violence, happened to be segregation laws. Uh, but I see the same uh, and, and a metaphor and analogy in the economics profession uh, by by not having the diversity, not taking advantage of the people who are in the field. Uh, you're also not taking advantage of their ideas. And when ideas become incestuous, they become less useful and the uh, whole field becomes less vibrant. So I, I think that the only way the economics profession is going to survive is by allowing the free flow uh, of uh, ideas. Now, we'll never be perfect. I, I understand that. But I also would suggest that we've got to be much more curious about others who were, are sitting in front of us, that we have to be uh, more welcoming. The, the, if we're just talking about the American landscape, you know, this is uh, becoming a majority minority uh, country. And I think that we really have to take advantage of the people who are, are with us. And one thing that I find in a calculation that I did with a colleague was to show that GDP could be between 0.6% and 4.4% higher per capita if more African Americans and women, those were the two groups I looked at. So I think it would be higher if you included uh, people of other uh, ethnicities and races more systematically. Uh, so, so everybody's losing out. It's not just African Americans and women who are losing out. It's uh, uh, the entire society, entire economy that is losing out. 
I don't know, Lisa. I, I, I think having more economists is not necessarily a good thing, but uh, I assume that work was a broader <laughs> look at inclusion. Uh, I mean, I see. I, I'm, that's a that's a that's a humorous remark, but it's but it's sure. also a serious remark. And then I don't sure. think I don't think we should have a goal of having X percent of the economics profession be have a certain makeup. I do think that it is a, a loss to the profession and a loss to the world at large uh, of how few there are, uh, how few uh, particularly black economists there are. There's, it's, it's a much more dramatic disparity right. between blacks and women, especially right. in the graduate school pipeline right now. Right. So, right. And I, I just believe like Janet Yellen believes. I mean, she has said that the uh, the lack of diversity of the economists who were analyzing the data related to the financial crisis was a cause of the financial crisis that led to groupthink. There was uh, little diversity in lived experience. And I think that's absolutely right. I think we get great questions when people have different lived experiences. So that's what I mean by the free flow of yeah. ideas. Sure. Yeah I, don't, yeah, I agree with that, obviously, although I don't, I don't know how important it is that – I don't know the, the relative importance of, say, black and female economists in talking about the, the financial crisis. I think certainly there was groupthink across non-racial, non-gender lines that, that was costly. Um, well, I think I think Janet would say otherwise. I mean, I think yeah, that I she started her, collecting. <laughs> she started collecting. She started collecting data at the San Francisco Fed, um, and she started seeing uh, all of the opportunities. I mean, you know, African Americans in the economy can be uh, canaries in the coal mine, and I think you know when she's out talking to different community groups about the mortgage crisis. She decided that this was not an asymmetric information uh, exercise. She could not just going out and saying what the Fed is doing, but collecting data from these community uh, development arms of the uh, of the Fed that, that they could be useful in getting information. And a lot of things happen to African Americans. Let's say unemployment. Uh, then, uh, I mean, we're a leading indicator for a number of things, including unemployment. So I think it was a good use of, uh, of data. And I think if you had people who had that lived experience, they could interpret data in a different way. I mean, I interpret data in a different way when I'm advising, uh, when I was advising the president of the United States at the CEA. And I think that I caught some things that other people didn't catch. I caught them earlier. So I I, th I think that you know you might discount uh, seeing uh, uh, black and female what we might add to it, but I think you would probably say the same thing about directions in a car. Meaning, right? meaning what do you that mean? we catch uh, women catch different things, <laughs> like how we how how I mean when you when we were flying. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't often, Lisa, I don't disagree uh, with you. I, I, what I disagree <laughs> with. Is on the financial crisis per se. I think the nature of the group think was not particularly racial or gender related. I don't disagree that having a, a wider range of life experiences could have improved our understanding of, say, the financial crisis or, or see, helped to see it earlier. So I don't think we disagree. It's just a question of, uh, of magnitude in terms of this particular piece of data. Um, Sure, I, sure. And she turned out to be the most accurate on the financial crisis, according to the Fed note. So I just think that uh, I think there's something to that. But but I don't want to focus too much on this yeah, particular okay. crisis. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and I liked your dance move before. So for those of you who, weren't, who missed the YouTube <laughs> video, if you only listen to the audio, you want to check out uh, the Econ Talk page at YouTube to see the uh, punchline to Lisa's comment there. Um <laughs> Getting serious again. Well, first, what what do you think the profession ought to be doing about this? The first thing that I think it should be doing is to encourage the uh, pipeline. And as you know, I've been director of the AEA summer program. I think it's a great program, and I think that it uh, it it fosters the kind of environment, both among the faculty and among the students, that we'd like to see to augment. Uh, the free flow of ideas. I think that's the first thing, but we can't focus exclusively on the pipeline. I think there's some issues related to workplace climate and workplace, um, the workplace in general that we need to address. As you saw from the climate survey, uh, you know, many more uh, women had been the 
uh, victims of sexual uh, sexual assault. I think this is one thing that the uh, New York Times pointed to, and I think it, it scared all of us. All of those uh, you know worked on that uh, survey. All of us who were reading those data were absolutely horrified to see this, and I think that we have to you know black women uh, report. Uh, having to do more than any other group to avoid uh, sexist and racist uh, behavior, you know, moving institutions, uh, not going to seminars, uh, doing other things like that. They also uh, report uh, being the most discriminated against and uh, discriminated against with respect to promotion and pay. So I think that we need to uh, make sure that we are closing these gaps, that we're not treating uh, women differently. For example, not asking them to do more service just because they are women or just because we think that they might be interested in it or we're not paying women because we think uh, that that's what they would accept. So, so there are things that we uh, can do that are best practices that appear on the AEA uh, website. But I think it's a it's a generational thing. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, we have to be better bystanders when we see things happening to our colleagues, uh, to our students. Uh, we need to step in and say something. This is uh, something that we haven't been doing as much of in the past, but I certainly think because we can be educated about it. Uh, and aware of it, I think we can do more of in the future. And I think this will augment the free flow of ideas. If people really feel like they can contribute, I think they will. Yeah, just uh, AEA stands for American Economic Association and uh, for for non-economists listening at home. And CEA is the Council of Economic Advisors that you alluded right. to earlier. Right. I think the, the bystander part's large and challenging. The cultural part's a huge piece of this, obviously. Um, when you have a bunch of one type of person running institutions, uh, in this case, mostly white men through until only recently, a set of norms developed that are not necessarily conducive to intellectual life, kindness, <laughs> a thousand things. And, and changing that is not going to be uh, easy. Mm -hmm. Obviously, changing it through that bystander effect for me is ideal, but uh, I suspect there'll be other attempts to use other more top-down ways to enforce it, but um, we'll see how that, that goes. That's right, and I think it was important that we adopted a code of conduct that, uh, and uh, so did NBR, so have uh, different National departments. Bureau. And I think the National Bureau of Economic Research for Economic Research. And I, I think that adopting that more widely does set uh, a set of expectations about how people will interact. We are getting rid of, of course, we're getting rid of that for this go round, but uh, interviewing in hotel rooms. Now that was, it didn't go to zero, uh, but I think it's a longstanding practice that some of us just got used to. We thought was weird. Our friends thought was weird. Uh, and it just took a fresh pair of eyes uh, from, from graduate students to get us to do better, to do something different. So I, I, I think there's, there's hope and you're right. Uh, people set the standard. Uh, my hope is that we have much better representation. I'm on the executive committee. I was elected last year, and I think that it's just a much more diverse committee than it's ever been. So I'm hoping that we'll bring some fresh ideas and uh, other uh, white men who are uh, allies who will bring uh, fresh ideas to the table. Uh, let's turn to the country. Um... You know, we're at a particularly powerful moment, or at least I hope we are. I think we are, uh, it, it, you know, for a variety of reasons, the death of George Floyd has mm -hmm. catalyzed. Re we reached a tipping point of some kind. Um, the challenge for for me, it, the way I see it, is that, that now the challenge is to do something that actually makes the world better, not worse. The, the two areas that I worry the most about uh, in terms of policy as opposed to culture just talking about culture, obviously culture is a huge part of this, but in terms of policy, um, police, policing and education are two areas where I think uh, the black community has um, been been punished and uh, in inappropriate way, horrible ways. And I'm curious where you think we ought to go from there. I think the, I think the cries for, quote, defunding, although you can debate what that word means in different contexts, but uh, 
that's not so straightforward as far as I'm concerned. In terms of education, I think we need to try something radically different. I'm curious your, your take on those two issues. I think those are, are great issues to bring up, and I think we are at a very important moment. I would argue, and I've argued before this happened, before the death of uh, George Floyd, that because my father used to be administrator of a mental institution, and I've seen uh, deinstitutionalization, and I've seen police take on roles that yeah. are absolutely not within their training. And they, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, I think we're asking them to do way too much. So in that sense, I would like for there to be uh, you know, more attention to what we're asking the police to do. I'd also like for them to be uh, to be trained better. In most states, and I've, I've seen the data for various states, it seems as though uh, police have fewer hours of training than hairstylists so and and uh, and nail techs. This is one of the most important jobs in the community. And obviously, as I've been talking to you about the rule of law, uh, Russ, it seems to me uh, such an important pillar of society that I would like for them to to focus on that. And we hear these stories all the time of uh, people going to jail and going back to jail, getting in the uh, criminal justice system, because that's where they can get their meds. That's where they can get drug treatment. Why are we putting all of this on the police? That's not what they're supposed to be doing. So I think we need to have them focused on on uh, uh, public safety and get them trained properly so that they can do what they're asking, what we're asking them to do, rather than do uh, a lot of other things. That's number one. Number two, with respect to uh, education, I certainly think that uh, education has, has got to be a way that uh, Americans see themselves going forward. And... I would also say, though, that we've got to change uh, racial discrimination uh, such that the education that people have is actually used, that this is a part of the free flow of information that I'm uh, talking about, especially in your neighborhood, Russ, because in Silicon Valley, what I find is that workplace discrimination, uh, especially in this, uh, in this era uh, post George Floyd, there are a lot of conversations about how uh, African Americans were let go, were not funded, were uh, subject to workplace harassment. And just before the George Floyd uh, incident, just before this happened, tech companies were scaling back anything that had to do with uh, attracting more minorities to their firms because they were coming under such pressure, uh, such backlash from uh, their uh, white counterparts in these uh, firms. So I think that that's a serious issue that has to be uh, addressed, fundamentally addressed, and at all levels, uh, especially it's the innovation economy that I know uh, most about. So that's, uh, that's where I would say we need to leverage the education that already uh, exists. And we need to make sure that uh, African Americans are showing up and, and women are showing up uh, where they may not have been welcomed uh, before. And again, I've focused on STEM education before, and I still think there need to be more more participation on patent teams. Uh, patenting by women is one order of magnitude lower than it is for uh, men in the patent data set. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. And what we do know is that co-ed teams, that, that diverse teams, uh, are more productive at patenting than uh, those who are not. Uh, Single-sex female uh, teams are uh, the, are less productive than single-sex male, but they're both less productive than those that are integrated. So I'm just saying that we've got to leverage the education we have, do a better job at welcoming people into educational spaces where they haven't been welcomed before. So I agree with you on that. There's a lot more that we could do, uh, making sure that there's rural broadband, for example. I think this is something that's been laid bare by uh, an and equitable, universal broadband. So even within our urban spaces, there isn't uh, enough broadband to get the educational outcomes, more uniform educational outcomes. There's a lot to do. 
There's absolutely a but lot I, to do. I, I think the K through 12 part of it is is just a terrible uh, barrier to the kind of inclusiveness that you'd like to see, say, at the tech level and the <laughs> STEM level. And I think no, that's right. That's right. And the Chetty, the uh, the work of Chetty at all shows us this. You know, the exposure to inventors actually uh, changes one uh, one's life outcomes. Right. And uh, what we see is that uh, minorities and poorer children who don't have access to inventors have uh, worse life outcomes. And I know that's that's a correlation. Uh, but the, this uh, entire research, I think, was elucidating uh, just using those uh, correlations. So we'd, I would hope that we would be able to get better uh, better K through 12 uh, education and education along many different dimensions. Yeah, well, we have a lot to do, but I, you know, the main thing I would urge people to to think about is trial and error. Uh, we've we failed at mm-hmm. universal mm-hmm. attempts to reform education, especially for for people in poor families, as you mentioned, and I think it's a it's a disgrace. Um, That's right. And there are a lot of great experiments that are going on, say, at Michigan State and at the University of Michigan, at, you know, promising uh, college to high achieving students uh, who are of lower socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. And it's just that promise, just that promise that makes a big difference because they, they don't even think that this is something that yeah. they can afford, that their families can afford. And it can have an effect on the entire family, the outcomes, the uh, ultimate outcomes of the entire family, not just on that individual. So I think that there are a lot of uh, experiments that are going on that need to be replicated. And I think you're right. We have to keep, we have to keep trying. We have to keep with these experiments. Typically they take place at one university at a time or one state at a time, but I think there's a lot more we can replicate. Yeah, but I I didn't, I didn't mean literally experiments, so I'm not, uh, that's okay. I just want more innovation at the on the ground at the school system that I want to get away from the public school system, the way it's uh, regimented. And I think it's just, it needs an overhaul, but. And okay. I, I'll I'm leave gonna, that to my, uh, my colleagues who do, uh, who do specialize in education. I don't want to step on their, their feet, but from what I see uh, from, from the policymakers perspective is that uh, a lot of these experiments are going on in, uh, in, in bubbles and we just need to replicate them and we don't need to give up. I, I think you're, you're right. We don't need to give up on trial and error on innovation. And uh, there are a lot of these happening. So let's replicate what we've seen as being the successes. Yeah. Let's close with the state of uh, America. Um, a lot of people are increasingly suggesting that America's mission, vision, past is and present is irredeemable, that we are um, we're steeped in racism. We're a country built on slavery to, to at least a large extent. And going forward, we're going to need a new, need a new narrative. Obviously, there are people pushing back against that narrative. I'm fascinated by the idea that there, there is a narrative. I think a nation without a narrative can't really cohere. And I think we're what's up for grabs right now is what that narrative is. And I'm curious what you think that narrative might be going forward as we come to grips with um, with our past a mere you know, 300 years after it started. It's, it's a little late, but maybe not. What are your thoughts? The first thing that I'd like to say is that I may not be the typical economist and that I'm always hopeful. And I would say that uh, 300 years might be late, but it's never too late. First of all, we need to just acknowledge the history. Uh, This, uh, you know, and I, I grew up in Milledgeville, Georgia, the capital of Georgia during the Confederacy. And from from 1803 to 1863, and there are monuments to the Confederacy everywhere. I learned a lot about the uh, Confederacy. There's so much more that the country needs to learn. This is not just for African Americans to learn. Uh, it's not just for Southerners to learn, but the entire uh, uh, American country to learn. Everybody benefited from slavery. Everybody, everybody the, in the economy at the time, besides 
the uh, those who were enslaved persons or related to slave persons, enslaved persons benefited from the economy at that time. We have to come to terms with that. You know, it's not just universities who uh, bought and sold uh, enslaved people. Um, it is, uh, you know, institutions. It's it's banks that uh, insurance companies that uh, underwrote the ships. There was just so much uh, complicity and. We can't say that we're looking at it from a 21st century uh, lens. We can't just say that because there were people at the time saying that. And we know that. It's, and it's not just from the Hamilton musical that we <laughs> know that, but we know that from uh, a lot of the historical research that's been done. So I think that we we absolutely need some sort of uh, reckoning with that. There are many proposals on the table to uh, to study uh, the uh, possibility of, of uh, reparations, many economic proposals being put forward, and I think they should all be taken seriously. And I certainly think that institutions need to keep doing what we're seeing a number of institutions uh, doing, checking the names of buildings, for example, or uh, monuments that are uh, erected that are uh, named for uh, Confederate generals or for uh, uh, slave owners. Uh, we, we, we need to keep reconciling this history. We learn more, so uh, we need to do more. And as a person, again, who grew up around these uh, statues and these monuments, we don't see this in Europe. We don't see uh, statues and monuments to the Nazis uh, in, in Europe, where I lived for a good part of my life. I, I, I don't see this. We don't see it there. And I, I don't think that we need these uh, these constant reminders, these uh, these things that are intimidators. In fact, I have um, you know I've updated the lynching data, uh, and I've constructed this data set from eighteen. Uh, I'm sorry, from sixteen. 1683 to 1984, and what we see is that Confederate monument building. Uh, took the place of lynching, that it was a substitute for lynching. So it was meant to intimidate. It was not uh, done at the time of the Civil War. It was done 50 years afterwards and uh, at the time of the Voting Rights Act. So it was definitely meant to intimidate. So getting rid of those kinds of things, I think, would be a, a national acknowledgement of what the history actually was. And it's not a, you know, if, you, if you're a member of this party, you think this way, you're a member of that party, you think that way. No, there's, there's historians who were trained in this stuff actually uh, have made this determination. So I, I would say that we have to come to terms with that history in order to go forward. And I would hope that we are able to do it in the way that South Africa was able to do it. And uh, of course, there's an ongoing experiment in South Africa too, but at least starting with a Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission and making people uh, whole in that regard, figuring out who is, uh, who is to partake in that and ways that we can bring uh, more people into the economic opportunity fold. That's what I'm really concerned with. My guest today has been Lisa Cook. Lisa, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you so much for having me, Russ. It's been a great conversation. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.